Hello everyone and welcome to CramSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are discussing a paper entitled uh, Outcomes of Laparoscopic Splenectomy for Treatment of Splenomegaly, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, published in the World Journal of Surgery uh, just this month. Following that, uh, Professor Saba Balasubramanian will deliver uh, the final lecture of the series on uh, descriptive statistics and we'll be talking particularly about uh, special charts and special tables. So from next month we will be changing topic, likely looking at uh, some particular aspects of randomized clinical trials. So stay tuned for more. Hi everybody, um, my name is Helen Pfeiffer, I'm an SHO in Huddersfield on general surgery um, and then of course you all know um, Mr Gio Perrin, uh, he's one of the GI trainees that works with me and tonight we're presenting um, outcomes of laparoscopic splenectomy for treatment of splenomegaly, a systematic review and meta-analysis. It was published in the World Journal of Surgery in 2020. So some background from Geo to start. Right. So, um, well, we know that the laparoscopic approach is uh, very commonly uh, used uh, in uh, um, splenectomy, uh, both in the subacute setting and in the uh, elective setting. Uh, what we don't know for sure is whether this approach is applicable in the context of uh, a, a big spleen, so in the presence of splenomegaly, as uh, obviously, having a big spleen does cause uh, quite a few significant technical difficulties. Uh, to the point that a few years ago, uh, splenomegaly was considered an absolute contraindication to a minimally invasive approach. Now, we know that this is not entirely true nowadays, um, but we do still think that uh, a big spleen, and particularly um, a spleen weight that's significantly increased, uh, does add some morbidity and an increased risk of conversion rate, and this is sort of where uh, this paper sits uh, in terms of trying to shed some light. Uh, ball back to you, Helen. Thank you, Gio. Um, so the research question for this uh, paper um, was to analyse and clarify the best evidence in relation to the minimally evasive, invasive approach in splenomegaly as compared to open surgery. And this would be in regards to the relevant clinical outcomes. So the methods used, um, the systematic review was done using the PRISMA guidelines, PubMed, Medline, Science Direct, Scopus, the Cochrane Library and Web of Science were all searched and that's from 1992 to February 2020 and 1992 is important because it was the year that the laparoscopic splenectomy was um, uh, first done. Uh, only English language full texts were uh, used. Reference lists and previous meta-analysis were also cross-checked. Back to you, Gio. Yeah, so a few um, relevant clinical outcomes were evaluated in this context. The main aim is comparing laparoscopic versus uh, open um, splenectomy. However, as Helen will highlight throughout the presentation, other minimally invasive techniques are included in this analysis and compared with each other and with open splenectomy. So the main outcomes considered here are really length of hospital stay, operative time, excess blood loss, mortality, morbidity in terms of complications, and they do also look at spleen weight and size, uh, particularly trying to identify whether there is a significant difference between the laparoscopic uh, and the open group throughout uh, the literature. A ball back to you, Alan. Thank you, Gio. Um, so the inclusion criteria for the study were um, any observational, retrospective, prospective, randomised and non-randomised clinical studies. Uh, they needed to include the laparoscopic approach, open approach, hand-assisted laparoscopic approach or robotic approach. Um, data concerning operative time, excess blood loss, length of hospital stay, conversion rate and morbidity and mortality were extracted 
and also, like Gio said, the grade of, of splenomegaly. And this was in either spleen weight or spleen size. And only adult patients uh, were included. Uh, also, the indication for splenectomy must not be traumatic or there must not be any other intra-abdominal conditions. Back to you, Gio. Uh, all studies included um, in uh, this meta-analysis were assessed for methodological quality uh, and fairly standard uh, scales were used to do so. Uh, Newcastle Ottawa scale was used for uh, any um, non-randomized um, study, basically. Um, for randomized clinical trial, they used the ROB2, um, which is also named revised tool for assessing risk of bias in randomized tr clinical trials. And this is sponsored by Cochrane um, itself. Uh, all uh, binary outcomes and continuous outcomes were included uh, in the meta-analysis, uh, as I mentioned earlier on. And they did look at uh, heterogeneity between studies uh, and the random effect model was applied as appropriate depending on uh, the outcome that was considered. Uh, ball back to you, Helen. Thank you, Gio. So uh, to start with for the results, um, on the left is uh, at the PRISMA chart. So 1,378 uh, records were initially identified through uh, the database search. And then after removal of duplicates and assessing for suitability, a total of 20 um, were left over. However, only 19 were included in, included in the final meta-analysis, as one of the studies, the quantitative data reported, was not compatible with the studies uh, model. And then to the right hand side, we've just got a summary of the uh, total number of studies and the patients uh, included. So for the laparoscopic versus open splenectomy, there were 12 studies uh, totaling 652 patients. For the hand assisted laparoscopic uh, splenectomy versus an open splenectomy, there were two studies totaling 398 patients. The laparoscopic splenectomy versus hand-assisted laparoscopic splenectomy, there was five studies uh, in total of 306 patients. There was one study comparing the robotic splenectomy versus the hand-assisted approach. Um, and there were no studies found that were comparing the robotic splenectomy to the open splenectomy. Uh, back to you, Gio. Yeah, so uh, a few more results. Um, as mentioned earlier on, the primary aim of this meta-analysis is comparing laparoscopic versus open splenectomy. And uh, the authors do find quite significant results here. Uh, so length of stay was found to be significantly shorter in the laparoscopic group, 3.3 uh, days less. Um, the operative time was significantly shorter in the open splenectomy group by almost 45 minutes. And blood loss was also significantly less uh, by about 150 ml of, uh, of blood. Uh, no differences were detected, luckily, between uh, the two groups in terms of mortality uh, and morbidity. Uh, a point worth mentioning is that the average conversion rate from laparoscopic to open splenectomy in these uh, studies was 20%. Um, as mentioned earlier on, the authors looked at uh, splenic weight and size as well, uh, and they did not pick up any significant differences between uh, open or laparoscopic group. There is, however, what looks like potentially a typo uh, in the study itself, where they mentioned a P of less than 0.05. However, looking at the number, as you can see in the last two lines of this slide, um, and looking at the charts that we will um, see later on, um, it's unlikely that uh, uh, this is actually correct. So we think that p-value is a mistake. We will ask the authors, um, obviously. And in the next slide, um, you uh, will have a chance of looking at a few uh, forest plots. Um, so as you can see, uh, these are the variables that we just mentioned. So uh, length of stay uh, is pretty much uh, throughout all the trials. Um, far left of the line of no effect, uh, operative time on uh, the right hand side. Excess blood loss is pretty much through the line of no effect, however there is a statistically significant difference as we mentioned. And as you can see for mortality and complications there is a little bit more heterogeneity, so uh, some uh, studies fall on one side, some studies fall on the other side. Uh, ball back to you Helen. 
Thank you. So to continue the results, um, one of the secondary aims was comparing the laparoscopic uh, splenectomy versus the hand-assisted laparoscopic splenectomy. Um, and between these two groups, the only statistically significant uh, difference was seen in the conversion rate. So for hand-assisted, it was less. And then therefore, there was no difference for length of stay, operative time, blood loss or the complication rate. Uh, a further secondary aim was comparing the hand-assisted uh, laparoscopic splenectomy versus an open approach, um, and they found length of stay was significantly lower after the hand-assisted uh, procedure. Operative time was lower for the open approach, and excess blood loss was lower for the hand-assisted approach. Um, and like we said before, there was only one study that compared uh, robotic connect me with another approach. Um, this was a retrospective study uh, that was a robotic versus laparoscopic approach, uh, which there was 12 versus 27 patients. Um, and they found a longer operative time and led less, less blood loss for the robotic splenectomy. Over to you, Gio. Yes, yeah, so um, as mentioned earlier on, quality of the studies included was uh, evaluated. Uh, and as you can see, for the vast majority of the studies based on Ottawa scale, um, the quality uh, was uh, reasonably high. Uh, they had some concerns only uh, in a handful uh, of them throughout uh, the various cohorts that were compared. Uh, ball back to you, Alan. Thank you, Gio. Um, so some limitations. So these are the self-reported limitations in the paper. So to start with um, quality of included studies. So, of course, the meta-analysis is going, only going to be as uh, good as the studies that were included. So the majority of studies were retrospective, uh, which, of course, has limitations. Um, and there was only a few prospective and even fewer randomized control trials. Um, Secondly, so difference in the way that studies report splenomegaly. So there's two ways of assessing uh, spleen uh, size. So that's either in a sort of a preoperative uh, measure um, from a scan, for example, or the second way that is splenomegaly is measured here is spleen weight. However, that's only uh, available postoperatively. Um, therefore, it is by definition an outcome. Um, so the study does mention that it would be best for um, the way we measure spleno splenomegaly by um, using a pre-op size. Uh, however, pragmatically, most of the studies included, uh, they report spleen weight as their spleen measure. So that's why it's included in this study for practical reasons. Um, and thirdly, that there's a lack of standardised definition of splenomegaly, which will therefore affect um, the analysis of the data. Uh, and finally, they mention the concept of there's difficulty in analysing the outcomes according to the intention to pre treat principle. So, of course, as I mentioned before, a lot of the studies are retrospective and therefore there's not necessarily the information about which approach was intended um, for the uh, removal of the spleen. So, for example, the hand assisted approach, uh, they might not have originally planned to do hand assisted. They might have planned to do laparoscopic and that data is not necessarily there. So then may affect the uh, results of the meta analysis. Back to you, Gio. Yeah, a few more points that uh, we pick up along the way. Um, well, from a, the only real criticism I could find from a methodological standpoint was the uh, absence of a check for publication bias. Uh, I couldn't find it mentioned anywhere uh, in uh, uh, the meta-analysis itself. So potentially uh, negative uh, result studies might uh, not have been published and those uh, could potentially affect the results of uh, this meta-analysis. Um, as Helen mentioned, this is kind of in line with the intention to treat principle, really, but uh, we thought we'd mention it again. Um, I'm not really sure if we could consider the uh, hand-assisted laparoscopic spronectomy in itself um, rather a genuinely uh, a starting procedure or a step up or a conversion from something that was originally planned to be performed completely laparoscopically. Um, there's a few issues I've got with the uh, indications um, in the various papers. So this is not really uh, looked at. And obviously, uh, particularly if you perform a spronectomy in a patient with portal hypertension, um, 
complications will generally be higher. There will be an increased blood loss uh, and there will be an increased morbidity. So it would be interesting to know uh, what the indication was uh, throughout the board, uh, if that is in any way possible. Um, there is finally a technical point that has to do with the uh, vascular pedicle dissection technique. Um, we could use uh, Humalox clips, um, etc., etc. But generally speaking, um, if you want a quick splenectomy, um, staples uh, do work very well. And obviously, if staples have been used, particularly in some studies, that could have shortened operative time reasonably significantly. Um, so, ball back to you, Helen. Thank you, Gio. So, to conclude, um, the study shows that laparoscopic splenectomy may be performed safely and has advantages over the open approach despite a longer operative time. Um, the hand-assisted approach does show superiority to the laparoscopic uh, approach um, with a lower conversion rate and clear reduction in surgical difficulty. However, in the future, authors must use terminology and stratification in accordance with current guidelines in order to facilitate future data synthesis. And for stronger evidence, future prospective randomised studies with standardised spleen size um, reports are warranted. And this final slide is just um, a summary of the points that Joe and I have already made in this presentation. So thank you very much. So as usual, I'll uh, try and give you a brief overview of the discussion we had about the paper. As you will remember, throughout the presentation we discussed the concept of statistical heterogeneity where uh, different studies included in a meta-analysis do report different statistical uh, results, meaning that the difference they detect between two treatments is variable throughout the different papers included uh, in uh, the meta-analysis. So one study highlights a significant difference between the two treatments, another one doesn't, and the degree of difference detected uh, can be quite different. There is, however, a further important uh, concept to uh, keep in mind, which is clinical heterogeneity, whereby it's not just the results um, of the study that uh, are different, uh, but also uh, the types of populations that are included in the study itself. For example, in our case, um, it could be that um, the splenectomies performed uh, in the various different studies were performed for different indications different dermatological conditions, for example, uh, or uh, um, portal hypertension secondary to liver disease. And this does have significant consequences in the validity uh, of uh, the results. A further point we mentioned is related to combining the results of randomized clinical trials with non-randomized clinical trials. The authors do that in this particular meta-analysis, particularly um, for uh, um, the comparison of um, and assisted laparoscopic splenectomy and open splenectomy, as well as laparoscopic splenectomy versus hand assisted laparoscopic splenectomy. Given the different nature of a randomized clinical trial and the retrospective cohort uh, study, uh, this is not always methodologically advisable. Uh, we then uh, briefly discussed the role of Prospero and uh, Cochrane uh, in uh, uh, the context of meta analysis. Uh, and finally, we uh, highlighted um, how. The authors, um, similarly to what happens um, in other studies that we've reviewed before, use the words uh, prospective randomized uh, studies, where there is no such thing uh, as a non-prospective uh, randomized uh, study. All right, that will be all for our discussion. Uh, I will leave you now to uh, Professor Sababala Subramanian uh, teaching session. Thank you. So, um, descriptive statistics, that's what we are um, doing. Uh, we've done a couple of uh, lectures um, and called them parts one and two. So, we're in the uh, final stretch of descriptive statistics, right? So, what have we learned so far in the first two um, lectures? We discussed a, a few things. So, if you haven't, um, if you weren't at the last lecture, so you could go and uh, look them up. So we talked about data types, we talked about normal distribution, we talked about parameters that we use to describe data, which is based on the type of the data and whether um, the data is normally distributed or not, right? So here's this figure that uh, I'm, I've shown on a couple of occasions on the different ways in which data can be classified 
I find this a very useful figure to refer to from time to time. And um, whenever I have to uh, do descriptive statistics or I have to think about a statistical test to use. So again, very quickly, you can classify data as categorical or measurement or scale. You can uh, classify categorical data as qualitative or semi-quantitative and measurement or scale data is also called quantitative data. Um, using another kind of classification, we can split the data into nominal data, ordinal data, interval data, and ratio data, right? So I'm going to leave you to go back to those other presentations and have a look at it again if you are not able to uh, remember the differences between these different uh, types of data. I'm going to move on. We talk about data distribution. If it is quantitative data, um, we talked about the need to try and differentiate this um, into normal data or data that is normally distributed and data that is not normally distributed. And we talked about the various parameters that can be used to describe data based on uh, the type and distribution. For example, we said normally distributed continuous data should be described using mean and standard deviation, while continuous data that is not normally distributed should be described using the parameters such as median and range. Okay. We talked uh, about graphs and tables in uh, part two um, of our descriptive statistics series. Um, we discussed when to use um, which graphs and which tables. We talked about a few common mistakes and uh, I gave you a few tips. Now, now what we'll do is just summarize this again uh, using an example. So uh, uh, I'll highlight uh, the different ways to describe a single data set. And let's start off with an example. And let's consider uh, a scenario where we want to evaluate the relationship between BMI, body mass index, and post-operative pain scores. Let's say pain in the first 24 hours in a cohort of patients undergoing a specific operation, right? So if you're doing uh, this kind of study and you're collecting data, you might have data on a spreadsheet that uh, lists the BMI of the patients and lists the pain scores on day one. Uh, so you've got big, um, uh, long columns um, going down uh, up to 100 rows and showing the BMI and the pain scores for these patients, right? And if you're just wanting to describe it, Obviously, it is cumbersome and uh, complicated and not feasible to present your whole Excel sheet in the document or the report that you're writing. One way of doing it is by means of a bar chart. So we talked about bar charts. And in a bar chart, you might want to uh, categorize BMI into uh, three, four, or five different categories. And here you've got healthy, overweight, or obese, and then moderately obese. And you've got the median pain scores that are depicted uh, in the y-axis. So this is a simple way of describing uh, uh, the BMI, the, the pain scores, and the relationship between these two variables. But there are some problems. Obviously, um, categorizing them as healthy or overweight, obese, or morbidly obese can be problematic. The readers may or may not accept your definitions, your categories. And also, you lose a lot of useful information by just depicting median pain scores, right? Let's think of another way of doing this. So let's say you want to categorize pain scores as well and as for the severity of pain. So maybe one is very minimal pain, two is moderate pain, and three is severe pain, and you've got your categories of uh, obesity or BMI, and you uh, are plotting um, or depicting the relationship between BMI and pain in terms of the categories, okay? Again, this, this might be a useful, visually attractive way of doing it, but the problem is that uh, your categorization is artificial, and then you're not really um, depicting or giving the reader the picture of the scores. Right, how can we do this? How about a box and whisker? So we talked about box and whisker box, uh, as well in part two. So you've got your healthy and overweight, obese, and morbidly obese categories, the three categories of BMI, and you're plotting median and interquartile range uh, with regard to pain scores in each of these three categories. So in comparison to the bar charts, you, you're giving a bit more detail, 
And, but again, categorization is a problem because it's arbitrary as we discussed. Line charts, line charts um, um, show uh, the same scores um, as the bar chart, just as, um, as a line uh, going across the three groups. You, you often see this kind of representation in some surgical journals. This um, line chart should not be used for this kind of categorization or this kind of um, uh, description. Uh, they should be reserved for scenarios where you're looking at trends over time. So line chart should typically be used in uh, scenarios where you're looking at trends over a period of time. OK, so it can be done, but it's not ideal. How about a table? And the table, you can have your categories uh, along the uh, 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 along one of the columns, and then you can present the median of the range if it's um, not normally distributed data, or you can present mean and standard deviation if it's normally distributed data, so lots of numbers, and uh, so this is valid. Uh, the downside of this is that it is not visually representative. You don't really get a picture in your mind as to the relationship um, between these two variables. Okay, so there are a number of ways of doing it, and each of these ways and has their own sort of advantages and disadvantages. The thing to do, um, which, is, which would be considered most uh, optimal in depicting the relationship between these two uh, sets of these two variables, which is BMR and both of them are continuous variables, is what we call a scatter plot. Okay? So in the scatter plot, as you see here, you have the BMI on the x-axis, you've got the pain score on the y-axis. And uh, you simply uh, depict it in the study, the 100 patients, uh, as a little dot, which um, represents the relationship between the BMI and the pain score. Right? So it's visual. It depicts a relationship very clearly. There are no artificial categories. And it can show up a number of um, awkward or odd findings. For example, you find that. Um, the people uh, don't seem to have much pain at all. Um, sorry, there are no patients with very low pain um, scores, which is slightly odd. And also you find here that there are a number of patients who have a BMI of exactly 50, and you don't seem to have people with a BMI of more than 50. And that could be an article. Maybe there's a problem with the scales. The things to avoid in a scatter plot is a line. You sometimes find that people draw what they call a regression line across the scatter plot. And if the idea is to simply show the relationship between variables and not try and predict one variable from another, and obviously you're not going to try and predict uh, pain scores from BMI and vice versa, then a regression line should not be drawn. Okay. And the other um, uh, mistake that sometimes uh, happens is that people try and uh, join the dots in a scatter plot. And again, you shouldn't really join the dots because that really doesn't um, give you any extra meaning and might simply confuse the situation. OK. There's some background noise. Um, I don't know if uh, people need to mute their, uh, mute their microphones. Right. Now what we're going to discuss is a special type of table called the contingency table. So what is this? It's also called the cross tabs or cross tabulation. And simply, uh, it is uh, just a special type of frequency distribution table. It's often used in uh, uh, biomedical research. And basically, it shows the relative distribution of two categorical variables. So these two words are important. The distribution of two variables relative to each other, and they're usually categor categorical although sometimes you can, uh, you can have ordinal variables as well. So here's the contingency table. So what are the two variables? The first variable here is a test um, variable. So is the test positive or negative? So it's a binary variable. And the second variable is um, here in this example is a disease variable or the disease status variable. So is a disease present or absent. And then you've got these cells which ought to be mutually exclusive. So there are four cells here, because for each variable, you've got two options. So two times two is four. And then you have the um, totals represented as either column totals or row totals. Okay, 
and uh, um, I'll explain this in a minute, but uh, in a contingency table, ideally you ought to present either the column totals or the row totals, not both. Right. So you've got the same kind of contingency table presented in two different ways. The first one on the left is with the row totals, and the, the second one on the right is with column totals. Okay. Now, usually, or as a um, convention, we tend to present outcomes as columns. So outcomes in column headings. And this could be either outcomes following an intervention as uh, uh, an example, you know, dead or alive, or recurrence or no recurrence, or um, the occurrence of disease after exposure to risk factor. Those are outcomes, and in, by convention, they are presented as columns. And the risk factor of the intervention is usually presented as rows. I mean, you could do it the other way around, but if you follow a convention, then it's easier to, for, for, for readers to follow and interpret the data in the contingency table, right? The next thing, and uh, the next um, uh, thing to keep in mind is that when you're presenting totals and percentages, so on the left-hand side, you have um, row percentages and row totals, and on the right side, you have column percentages and column totals. Uh, which ones to present really depends on how the study was designed. So what do I mean when I say this? So if you have a case control study, and if you remember from our previous lectures on case control study, uh, you uh, may remember that you start off with people with the disease and people without the disease and go back and look to see if they had the risk factor or the positive or negative test. So it is clearly retrospective. You start off with the outcomes and therefore you should be presenting column totals and column percentages. On the other hand, if you are um, doing a cohort study or if you're critiquing a cohort study, in a cohort study, you start off with the risk factor of the intervention, you follow people over a period of time to see if the outcome has occurred or not. And therefore, because you're starting off with um, the risk factor or the intervention, over time, you should present row totals and row percentages. Okay, so I hope this makes some sense. Uh, if not, just have a look at the um, talk on case control and cohort study designs, and then come back to this, and, and uh, I'm sure may, that will be, uh, it'll be clearer for you. Right, so what's the value of a contingency table? And the obvious value is that it shows the relationship between variables. You look at the table, and then you know, and uh, you get some idea as to the relationship between the disease and the test. It helps you calculate parameters that assess association. So the common measures of association are the odds ratio and the relative risk. Where we have discussed this before in one of our previous talks, so you can look that up. And there are some other uncommon measures of association that um, I wouldn't worry too much about because they're not very commonly used in surgical research. And the next uh, thing it helps you do is it helps you determine uh, statistical significance of the association that you worked out. So if you've got an odds ratio of three, and then you have to do a test to determine if that odds ratio of three is statistically significant in this um, study. Uh, and we're not going to discuss statistical significance because that is inferential uh, statistics. And we're talking about descriptive statistics. OK, so we'll go on. And there are some other related tables called uh, a typical example is the pivot table um, Excel does it for you pivot tables you might have heard of and um, it is very different to the contingency table in a pivot table you get aggregates right and um, not in counts okay so aggregates are summated measures so they're very different and shouldn't be confused with the contingency table. All right so so much for a contingency table oh that's another slide. So, uh, yeah, this one other slide. So in a contingency table, um, in the tables that we've seen, you've got uh, two variables which have, each of which has two levels. But sometimes you can have three levels um, in one or more variables. So if you have three levels, that becomes a three by three table. If you have two levels in one variable and three in another, that's a two by three table and so on. So it doesn't always have to be a two by two table. That's something you need to keep in mind. Okay. Um, 
another mistake that um, I notice fairly commonly when I review papers is that people insert additional columns or rows for missing data like this. So in this table, you find that um, if you look at the column headings, you've got disease present as one heading. You've got disease absent as another heading, and then you've got unknown status as a third heading, right? And you will find that there are very few patients where the disease status is not known for a variety of reasons, and the authors have inserted yet another column and added the number of unknowns. I mean, they might assume that they're being open and transparent, and that's very good. But having a, um, a separate column for unknown status just distorts the relationship uh, between the uh, outcome and the risk factor so it is to be avoided and what we usually advise is that um, you remove the unknowns from your denominator and simply present uh, the uh, patients for which both the disease status and the test status is known and you can clarify that in your method section or your limitation section and say that you haven't you've excluded x number of patients 11 in this example uh, from the calculations from further analysis simply because the disease status was not known. All right, so now we're moving on. So we're going to talk about uh, the forest plot. I think a number of you might have heard of the forest plot. Uh, oh, you certainly have listened to a paper with lots of forest plots in it. So what is a forest plot? So a forest plot is a plot used to compare a specific outcome in two different groups reported by a number of similar studies and is usually done as part of a meta-analysis. So the outcomes, a specific outcome, which could either be occurrence of the disease, if you're looking at a risk factor or a diagnostic test, or the effects of interventions, if you're looking at a um, patient being alive or dead after different types of treatment for a specific cancer, for example. You might be looking at recurrence of uh, a disease, you might be looking at hospital stay, it could be any outcomes following different interventions. Groups and the groups are usually stratified by the risk factor or by the intervention. And the studies could either be randomized controlled trials or observational studies. And uh, ideally not a mixture of randomized controlled trials and observational studies as we discussed previously. Right, so here is an example of a forest plot. Uh, this is from a systematic review done by one of our students in Sheffield on um, hypocalcemia um, after thyroid surgery. So let's um, divide this forest plot into its various constituents and go through them. Right. Firstly, in the forest plot, you want to um, mention or cite the various studies that you've included in the forest plot. So you usually put them in chronological order. Um, that's not mandatory, but most people tend to do it, um, and they list the studies in the order in which they were published. So the older studies first, and the most recent studies uh, right at the end. Okay, so you're simply listing the studies. That's all you're doing there. The next step is you're telling us what the um, numbers are in the different groups, in the two different groups in each study, and what events were in the different groups. So here we have hypercalcemia as the event or the complication in patients with Graves' disease and patients without Graves' disease. And you're effectively comparing hypercalcemia rates in these two groups of patients. So for each of the study, you've got some Graves and some non-Graves patients, and you're, um, you're just um, writing down the numbers uh, of patients with the complication in both these groups. Okay. Then you have a column that talks of the um, effect size or the measure that you're interested in. In this example, the odds ratio. The odds ratio that uh, looks at the association between hypocalcemia and the, th the type of thyroid disease. And finally, you've got the plot, the forest plot. Okay, so we'll just um, explore the plot and look at it in a bit more detail. So this is the plot. So what does this uh, show? So it shows a number of squares, each a square um, specific for each study included in your meta-analysis, right? And the squares, um, the size of the squares reflect the effect size and the weight. So where the square is, 
and that gives you an idea of the effect size. So the first S graph example, uh, if you go down onto the X axis and it points to an effect size of about 1.3 or 1.4, which is the odds ratio in this particular example. Now, because the square is small, it probably reflects that uh, the, the reflects the sample size. The sample size is probably small. Okay, so that's what the squares represent. The lines on either side of the square or the whiskers, the horizontal lines that you see here, give you the 95% confidence interval around the um, effect size. Okay. Now the diamond here, low down, gives you the summated effect size, takes into account all of these four effect size from these four studies, and it gives you the aggregate. Right. Now, there's a vertical solid line, which is here, which you can see here. This is the line of no effect. So the odds ratio um, or relative risk, which are both ratios, the line of no effect will be one, which means that in both um, the uh, intervention groups and the non-intervention groups, the complication rate is the same or the outcome is the same, right? So that's the uh, vertical solid line, which is a line of no effect. Now. I've just drawn a dotted red line which passes through the middle of the diamond. So the dotted that, um, uh, red line, vertical dotted line, shows the summated effect, summated measure that you get by doing the meta-analysis, which is the aggregate of all of these four studies. So it usually passes through the middle of the diamond, the black diamond. And the edges of the diamond as marked here, and gives you the 95% confidence interval of the summated measure. And what you should be looking for is whether the edges of the diamond overlap the line of no effect, which is the vertical solid line. And here it does not overlap the line of no effect. And that means that that's a significant result. So you've got the odds ratio of almost 1.8, which is a summated odds ratio for this meta-analysis with 95% confidence intervals of around 1.5 to 2.3. And that 95% confidence interval does not include um, the odds ratio of one, which is a line of no effect. And therefore, this is a significant result. The summated measure, the summated odds ratio in this meta-analysis is significant. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. Now, this FX size, or, or measure can either be a ratio, for example, odd ratio or relative risk or attributable risk, or it can simply be the difference. For example, you're looking at difference between um, difference in length of stay in Graves' disease and non-Graves' disease patients undergoing thyroidectomy. So there you have a difference. It's not a ratio, right? And the SMD refers to standardized mean difference between the groups. So if you have a standardized mean difference, uh, the SMD, then if there's no difference between the groups, then the line of no effect should be zero, right? If you have um, an effect size which is a ratio, i.e. odds ratio or relative risk, then the line of no effect would be one because, uh, because that's what ratio uh, means. If the ratio is one, that means there's no difference. So I hope that makes um, sense. So you've got to keep in mind that the line of no effect should be at one if it's a ratio, for example, odd ratio or relative risk. But it should be at zero if, it, if you're looking at difference between groups. So when you look at um, a forest plot like this, there are two key questions you want to answer. One is, what is the summated measure? So in this case, it is 1.8. And does that, um, does the 95% confidence intervals or the edges of the diamond overlap the line of no effect? So those are the two key questions you want to try and answer when you're looking at a forest plot. The forest plot also um, demonstrates heterogeneity, statistical heterogeneity. In other words, how different are the results of studies to each other? So they all on one side of the line of no effect. And in this case, all these squares are on the right side of the line of no effect. Or are they a bit, are they a bit scattered? 
and are the odds ratios relatively similar or very different. So that gives you a visual understanding of the statistical heterogeneity of the different studies in the meta-analysis. Right, so we've done forest plot. The last plot uh, we're going to discuss today is the funnel plot. Right, so what's the problem? Why do you need this plot? Now, meta-analysis generally uses published data, usually. You don't find uh, authors of meta-analysis and systematic reviews um, trying to get hold of non-published data um, to include in their meta-analysis, right? And uh, we all know that a number of studies may just not be published for whatever reason. There are numerous reasons for that. And it is quite possible that there are some differences, some underlying systematic differences between data that is published and data that is not published. OK, so that is a problem. Now, what this can result in is what we call publication bias, which means that it is possible that the summary measure of your meta-analysis may not really be the true effect. Because there are some important studies that are not being published and that deviate or pull you away from the truth. And they could be because the publication getting delayed, there are some big studies coming out and you yeah, and um, it may come out in print just months after you've published your meta-analysis. That could be a reason. It could be that um, the same study has resulted in numerous publications and you've included the same set of data over and over again. It could be because um, there is a language bias or citation bias. It could be because negative results or studies that do not show difference between interventions just don't get published because journals and editors and reviewers are just not interested in uh, negative results. That's another problem. That's another common problem. Right. So one way in which you get to assess publication bias is by um, plotting a funnel plot. Right. So we've understood how a funnel plot um, may be useful. So let's look at the constituents of a funnel plot. So this is a, 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 an ex a good example of a funnel plot. I've taken this from a, a free available paper in the BMJ. So what does this show? So it shows a number of uh, blue dots, right? Blue dots covered by a black circle. And each of these dots represents a single paper. So the number of papers in this meta-analysis and each paper is represented by a blue dot or a circle. Now on the x-axis, you have the effect size. This effect size, like I said before, could be an odds ratio, could be relative risk, could be standardized mean difference, and, and so on, right? And because the ratio in this particular example, they've represented this on a logarithmic scale, as ratios usually are. On the y-axis, here in this example, you've got standard error, but you could also have what we call sample size. So effectively, what you're doing is you're comparing the odds ratio of, of uh, in these various studies to their standard error here okay so you're comparing uh, you're, you're plotting the relationship between two quantitative variables so in other words this is essentially a scatter plot the funnel plot, right so what what about this uh, triangle the dotted triangle now the dotted triangle is a triangle that you that you calculate the work out using the software and this represents the area in which 95% of these studies should lie when you plot them um, uh, on the basis of their odds ratio and, your, and their standard error. Now, the vertical um, dotted line is the summary measure of the meta-analysis, just like we showed where we discussed with the forest plot, right? So here it's around 0.5 or so. And the solid uh, vertical line is a line of no effect. And like I said before, it should be at one uh, because it's a ratio. So for odds ratios and relative risk, uh, the uh, line of no effect should be one. OK, so in a uh, funnel, in this funnel plot, all of these studies are within the dotted triangle. And these studies are fairly symmetrically placed around the uh, summary measure or the dotted vertical line, okay? So that, that's what you're looking for, you're looking for symmetry around the summary measure. And it is fairly symmetrical, okay? Right, so you look for symmetry around the vertical dotted line, 
And um, if there is asymmetry, then there could be a problem. Now that problem may be publication bias, but there are lots of other reasons for asymmetry. So just because you have asymmetry in the funnel plot doesn't mean there's publication bias. It could be publication bias. It could be significant heterogeneity between studies, in which case you shouldn't really have Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.